Very good afternoon and welcome to this EPC briefing on prospects for global climate action after COP26. I'm Annika Hedberg, I'm heading Sustainable Prosperity for Europe program at EPC, and I'll be discussing today with Peter Hill, CEO of the 26th UN Climate Change Conference, about the state of play with climate negotiations, including the prospects for implementing the numerous promises that were made during COP26 in Glasgow. And with time ticking, the permanent question is, how do we maintain and raise global climate ambition also as we head to COP27 in November. As always, we hope to engage with our participants and look forward to your questions and comments. And for this, if you are interested to ask questions, you can either click on the hand icon if you wish to speak, or alternatively, you can use the space provided to ask short written questions. Pisa, we are delighted to have you join us today. As you were appointed, the COP26 CEO and Director General of the COP26 unit in October 2019. You've obviously been at the heart of the preparations and follow up to the COP. So we obviously will be very interested to hear from the COP presidency perspective, how would you evaluate the current state of play in international climate negotiations? Where have we progressed or not enough? Also, um, as it is very, very difficult to have any discussion today without recognizing the ongoing Russian attacks in Ukraine. I'd be happy to also hear from you what kind of implications could this have on global climate action? Before be becoming COP26 CEO, you were the principal private secretary to Prime, Min Prime Minister May, director general for the Prime Minister's office, as well as the Prime Minister Sherpa, for the G7 and G20. So having seen how the heads of state and government operate, how focus goes, where energy flows, what kind of short and longer term implications could this Russian aggression in Ukraine, in Europe, and this geopolitical crisis have on global climate action and the prospects for collaboration? So uh, happy to hear from you. Absolutely delighted to have you here with us and uh, looking forward, uh, forward to uh, your first initial remarks. Thanks. Thank you so much, Annika. And yes, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe speak for five or 10 minutes and then we can get into, into questions. Um, and like you, I think it would be a bit odd not to say what a strange time this is to be, uh, to be doing this. I think it's still important to actually to be talking about these issues, but um, I've spent a lot of my career working on foreign policy and security issues. Uh, including on questions of European security. And so I think it's, it's, it, it would be wrong not to just mark what an extraordinary and uh, shocking and upsetting uh, a series of events we're witnessing. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm personally sort of uh, shaken by it, uh, however widely expected it was, um, it's there's still something slightly incredible about uh, a conflict of this nature on the European continent um, today. Um, I'll come to maybe a reflection on what it might mean for climate action uh, uh, towards the end. I suspect the short answer is it's a it's a bit too soon to tell, um, but, but maybe we can we can talk about that a bit in the Q&A. So I thought I'd say a little bit about um, what I think happened uh, in COP26 um, and why it was important and, and what needs to be done uh, in the course of this year. Uh, and then a little bit about um, particularly the European dimension. Um, <clears throat> so I think the, the, the Glasgow agreement, the Glasgow series of agreements, I think were important. Um, and I think they were a significant achievement. And I don't mean by that, you know, they were a significant achievement of the presidency. They are a collective achievement. Um, and I think the fact of the agreement, before we come to the substance, the fact of the agreement is just worth pausing on because it's not obvious that in a, uh, I mean, even before the events today, it was clear that the international system uh, is pretty uh, fractured and um, relations between many of the actors, whether that's East, West or North, South are quite challenging uh, and cooperation is not always the default choice. So <clears throat> I think to be able to reach an agreement was, uh, significant and important and I think if we had failed to do that I think we would have been facing a very different international picture on climate I think whatever the tensions the difficulties and the frustrations 
cooperation on climate is broadly positive sum and it's broadly cooperative uh, and that is you know there's not too many areas of uh, the international architecture of which one can say that at the moment so i think the fact of it was important and i think without it would be facing a different context and i think zero sum thinking on climate would have got a boost and that would have had implications domestically for the debate in all our countries about climate action and it would have had an, imp an implication internationally including for issues like trade so i think the fact of the agreement is very important on the substance um i think uh there's there's two things to say one i think the outcome is very significant and very positive and the second is it's not nearly enough so on the positive side um, if you look at the commitments countries made um, both in terms of their mid-century net zero commitments their medium-term commitments and a number of the policy announcements which people made whether that was on power or transport or industry or forestry those were very positive and i think they were probably more than we might have expected running into glasgow and i think that tells you that the story of transition and of decarbonization in the global economy is a real one and it is accelerating and so i think the fact that we were able to shift the dial on those targets and on the underpinning policies was a real positive having said that it's not nearly enough and although i think we can credibly say the prospect of 1.5 degrees warming is still alive it's hanging by a thread and it depends in good measure on what we collectively do this year um, the glasgow agreement i mean for those who've read it it has an awful lot of there's an awful lot of substance there and one of the key elements uh, that countries agreed was that we would not wait five years or two years to look again at what we're doing but we would do it this year and so we would look again at what we're doing for 2030 this year and so that really is i think one of the key tests of whether the words of the glasgow climate pact are worth the paper they're written on um, and whether countries meant what they said is whether in the course of this year we deliver on those commitments to improve where necessary our targets and to uh, strengthen the underpinning policies that give them credibility um, uh, so it's going to be a challenging year to deliver those but in a way that's nothing new and uh you know nothing is nothing difficult is ever uh, uh easy also <laughs> nothing important is ever easy so i think um the job of the presidency with our partners is to carry on encouraging countries down that down that path um uh the second aspect of of um glasgow was uh what we said and did on a number of the issues that most affect vulnerable countries and i particularly pick out the issue of adaptation where I think we made significant progress, including on the question of finance with a commitment to double adaptation finance by 2015, on setting up a work program to define more clearly uh, progress towards the global goal on adaptation, uh, on loss and damage, as we all know, a very difficult contested issue uh, where we're starting a, a program of work. And, and of course, not everyone got what they wanted on it, uh, and some of those differences and difficulties are, are not going to be resolved easily, but where we're starting the work to try and understand better uh, what are, what do we mean, what are the losses and damage, and how can countries be supported in, in addressing them. Uh, and then the broader issue of finance, where we fell short in meeting the 2020 commitment on the 100 billion, but we nevertheless managed to um put together a credible pathway for meeting it by next year uh, at the latest um and i think you started to see some progress in the in the engagement of the private sector in mobilizing private finance because it's clear that there's never going to be enough public money and we have not done well enough collectively at mobilizing private finance and turning the uh the very large sums of private finance that are looking for green investments into real world investments in green projects in developing countries uh, and there was one particular example of that you'll have seen at glasgow which was a, a transition partnership uh, with uh, south africa between a number of countries which is the start of a long-term commitment i think to that process and that relationship um, and uh, while i wouldn't well, i hesitate to use the word model 
football, because every situation is different. I think that idea of bringing together partner countries, those who wish to decarbonize and accelerate their decarbonization with donors, with the international uh, architecture and private donors uh, and private finance, I think is one that um, we are looking with a number of partners at how we, how we might expand that in the course of the year, because it's essential that those who want to accelerate their climate action have the support to do that. And they feel that is real rather than simply uh, headline, headline numbers. And then, of course, very importantly, going to my first point, closing the rule book, which I think was not obvious. Um, and for many people, these are sort of slightly esoteric technical issues. I just say two things. Firstly, they do make a real so questions of transparency and the functioning of carbon markets do make a real difference to whether one can credibly say we're on a path towards 1.5. And the second is. Uh, if the world is unable after five years to reach an agreement on these issues, what would it have told you about the state of the international climate system? So I think for both those reasons, clo closing the rule book was, was really important. Last two quick points on, on sort of partnerships. Um, for us this year is, is, large, is, is very much about delivering on what the Glasgow Climate Pact set out. Um, that's incredibly challenging. We know the context is, you know, that as ever, there will be different things in the context, whether they're to do with, uh, you know, gas prices, concerns about energy security, geopolitical tensions. Um, it's not to say that those aren't important, but in every year you want to progress climate action, there are headwinds. And there will be headwinds in 2022. And the job of the presidency with partners and others is to try and try and move the ball down the pitch. So particularly this year, I would say, our partnership with Egypt as the incoming presidency will be very important and we're working closely with them, uh, with our German friends and their, their chair of the G7 and with Indonesia uh, in the chair of the, of the G20. And lastly, I just say a word about the role of, uh, of the EU and European partners. Um, it was very important in the run up to Glasgow and at Glasgow, um, both in terms of the ambition that the European Union was setting out in terms of its fit for 55 um, uh, ambition, in terms of uh, the support that we felt we had at Glasgow for progressing towards uh, uh, the outcome of the climate pact. Um, and certainly I've worked extremely closely with many, uh, well, I guess friends actually, who I've known for many years in the commission and the institutions over the course of the last two years in trying to progress that. And I think, the delivery of that package, however, whether it's this year or takes a bit longer, the delivery of that package is going to be extraordinarily important in demonstrating that targets are backed up by action. And the partnerships of the European Union and European member states with other key actors, I mean, I, one could name them, but I'm sure you can imagine who they are, uh, the partnership with those countries to persuade them as well to accelerate action uh, is going to be really important and the very close working that we've had with our, our European partners I think will be an important and also an important element of, of 2022. Uh, Annika I've probably talked too much I'm going to stop there and uh, I'm happy to take any questions on that I'm also conscious that there's there's many issues that I've, I've not covered and as far as I'm able I'm, I'm happy to pick them up so over to you. No, thank you Peter very much for this introduction and providing this overview and uh, for the time being, I don't see any hands up, I don't see questions, but maybe I'll just start and uh, let's see if we can get uh, some additional questions from the audience. You yourself, you said that the prospect for 1.5 degree uh, decrease um, limit is hanging by a thread. And indeed, we see that many are very afraid that we are not on track um, towards achieving the goal of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees of Celsius, that we are not on a secure path on achieving global net zero carbon emissions by 2050. So certainly the pressure is on and this discussion um, needs to continue. And obviously we need to find all the ways, the channels, uh, possibilities uh, to keep the momentum on. So um, also from that perspective, very delighted to organize this discussion today uh, because certainly uh, <laughs> The pressure is on and it will not disappear. I would like to just come back to you um, on some of the things. So the countries um, 
in Glasgow. They were asked to come back in 2022 with strengthened emission reduction commitments. I'd be happy to get your feeling on where we are. How hopeful are you that we'll see adequate NDCs? And uh, also I'll pick on something that uh, raised a lot of attention at the COP, which was that there was um, attention that was paid to the need to end coal-fired power. And the agreement includes the first ever reference to the role of fossil fuels in the climate crisis, the need to face down coal and in efficient fossil fuel subsidies. How do you evaluate the implications of this? And now as some months have passed, are you seeing some concrete measures taken in line with this commitment? Um, really, really good question. So on the on the commitments and on the one and a half degrees, it's absolutely, I mean, it's a sort of statement of, 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 of the obvious that we're not on track for one and a half degrees, but the, the possibility to get on track exists. And that's what Glasgow enabled. And now it's sort of the exam question for this year as to whether we're going to do that. And Glasgow set up the expectation that we should try and do so and not, and not wait uh, and say, OK, we've done our job for 2030 and now we'll move on to 2035. No, Glasgow said we haven't done enough. We need to look again at 2030. And what needs to happen? So um, there's a number of sort of elements to that. The first is, does everybody have a mid-century net zero commitment? Does everybody have a 2030 target, which is consistent with that mid-century net zero commitment? Does everybody have policies which give credibility to those commitments? And as you go and as you look around the world, different countries are in different positions on each of those. So some might have a mid-century commitment, but not an aligned 2030 commitment. Some might have a 2030 commitment, but no mid-century. Some have announced policies about their intentions, but they have not put those into their NDCs. Some have NDCs, but they don't have the policies which give you confidence that they're going to deliver. So it's a mixed picture. And I think where the objective is to get to the place where every country has all of those elements, because that's what it's going to take. And so our job over the course of the year is with partners and with others, country by country, particularly with the major emitters, to go around and say, OK, you've got a mid-century net zero target. You've got a 2030 target, but it doesn't appear to align with your med, med so how can we help you or what are your intentions and and as the presidency you know you don't have the power to make anyone do anything so what you're doing is trying to create momentum and confidence that they should move and and i sat in a number of conversations between leaders at glasgow and the thing i was struck by was uh I think many of them came away with a sense that this transition is real, it's happening and it's accelerating and they need to be part of it. So I, um, you know, the global transition to net zero is going to happen. I'm absolutely sure of that. The problem is it's happening far too slowly. And one thing we do not have is time. And so all our objectives are about accelerating and driving momentum. And I think having leaders believe that this is going to happen is an important part of that. And I think many of them came away from Glasgow believing that. Um, now, there's all sorts of things that they need to support them in doing that. But I believe that when I think about the major countries that we interacted with, I think many of them at the leadership level came away strengthened in their conviction after Glasgow, not weakened. On coal, um, it's a mixed picture. So in the short term, uh, you know, in many national capitals at the moment, there's a debate going on about the impact of high energy prices, about energy security versus transition. Uh, and in some you're seeing the reaction to that being to burn more fossil fuels. Uh, and some are, you know, I suppose, predictably using this energy crisis to say, there you are, you know, you've made a mistake, the transition is not, we're going too fast, um, it's imposing costs, etc. Um, whereas I think from, you know, my country's perspective, and I'm sure many that what this is showing is that we need to go, that we've lost our lighting, we'll try and get it back, there we go. Um, what it's showing is that we need to go further and faster. In the renewable uh, uh, journey but but the key thing is that debate is going to happen and those who are in supporting climate action must be engaged in that debate and not assume that it will take care of itself and come out in the right way and i think one can look at those things and be concerned 
But you also have to look at the other side, which is what is happening, for example, in India on the rollout of their renewables program? What is actually going to happen this in the course of this year in China on the uh, on the construction of new coal plants and on the phasing of, of out of old coal plants? So I think in the course of the year, we will see how far countries are serious about the commitments they made. And although there are in the immediate term some things that are not encouraging, I, I, I haven't given up yet the hope that when countries said they were committed to phasing down coal, they meant it. And that whatever the temporary debates that a number are having internally, by the end of the year, we will have seen that the plans give reason for, reason for optimism. Because as we all know, uh, if you can't accelerate the phase out of coal, keeping one and a half degrees alive is, is extraordinarily uh, difficult. Absolutely. And obviously this challenge with the fossil fuel subsidies, uh, it is a challenge also for Europe. Uh, we are significant subsidizers of fossil fuels and this whole question around the transition and the balance uh, remains very much alive. In, in Europe as well. I'll pick on and actually provide a good link to some of the questions that we had. So we have a question from Emily Strupp on how can we continue to ensure high climate ambition across Europe in the context of high energy prices and conflicting pressures of where to invest limited funds. And we also have a question from Rachel Simon, um, who recognizes uh, the role that especially private sector can play in shifting finance flows. And uh, the question is that taking the huge role of the UK and other developed countries in global financial services, how should we address this? And could you comment on how action to shift global financial flows can be brought into the UN FCCC arena and how the UK should be aligning its domestic policies with 1.5 degrees, for example, with UK taxonomy? Um. Well, there's a lot there on the, on the high, uh, what to do in the in an era of high energy prices. I mean, I think one of the things is you have to engage in the debate in every sort of political entity, constituency, country, region, because there are those who are arguing that the energy crisis and the high energy prices show that the transition is happening too fast. Um, and of course, there is a scenario in which if you um, constrain supply before you have uh, um, uh, before you have sorted out the market, you could get um, disruptions. But nevertheless, I think for us, the main message is um, we need to build out renewables faster. Not, and I think that's, uh, and I'm sure no one is, but all those involved in climate action, I think, need to be conscious that that is a debate which you need to take part in and not let it go, because I think you know, we can't assume that these things will uh, will come out in the in the right place. So um, in our travels, even since Glasgow and even in the, the background of the of the current crisis, um, we have found no let up in people's commitment to building out renewables. So whatever noises that we're hearing, <clears throat> I think we are still finding that commitment to accelerating the build out of renewables is is strong and it's partly just a simple economics question now uh, which is the compare the the price of uh, of uh, wind and solar to um, coal and include and increasingly to gas uh, I think those economics are speaking to ministries in a way even two or three years ago when I started this job uh, I think an understanding of the economics is much more uh, widely spread in key ministries in key countries. So um, I think make the argument. Um, the second is uh, make sure the finance is available because um, for some countries there are, you know, the cost of capital for these investments is an issue. Um, and uh, although there's no silver bullet, uh, the engagement of the multilateral development banks, of national banks, of the private sector and donors can help address some of those questions about the mobilization of finance. Um, now, they are not, and this goes to the question about finance, they are not simple, they are not easy, because if they were, we would have sorted them previously, and we would have a much better record of mobilizing private capital than we do previously. And there are people who are, you know, with some 
with some reason skeptical that we're going to succeed this time i think the reason to be hopeful is that um i think most of the most both public and private authorities now see the direction of travel and think that it is inevitable now there might be discussions about the pace of it and i think that is now firmly rooted in a sort of collective consciousness um there is a lot of private sector money as people probably on this call will know better than me looking for investments and there are governments who want that investment and the job that i think we have together is to try and gear those two things better because at the moment they're still too far apart there's a wall of money people say and there's countries who want to make the transition of course that marriage doesn't happen of itself so one of the things that i think the country partnerships and the country platforms which are being discussed in the g20 can do is both in general and specifically say how are you going to bring to bear public finance to de-risk investments to bring in the political commitment and the regulatory changes that partner countries need to make so that private finance is able to be mobilized at a greater scale it's not a new challenge and our success has been as if you look at the mobilization figures for for public finance to date they're not what they should be um so i don't have i can't promise that we're going to solve it but i think that is the that's the core challenge for the next year or two through the g7 through the g20 through these country partnerships to do that better uh, than we have to date uh, as far as the uk is concerned um i think the so we have um uh, the, our national targets for our carbon budgets and our NDCs, I think, are quite strong. Our own climate change committee uh, concluded a month ago, I think, that those targets were compatible with the Paris Agreement and with 1.5 degrees. Like many others, the work that we've got to do is deliver them. We are now in the, the challenging business of actually working out and delivering those in power, in transport, in land use, in buildings, in heating, in industry. Uh, and so we set out a net zero strategy, I think, uh, uh, in October, November last year. Uh, and, you know, rather as the European Union is, we're now engaged in that real world business of making those targets reality. So I think that's the, the, the in the case of the UK, the question that people will rightly challenge us on is not our targets, but how are you progressing on an implementation? And um, by all means, perfectly reasonable to hold our feet to the fire uh, over the course of the months and years as to, uh, ahead. And uh, very much the same kind of discussions that need to be taking place in the EU and are taking place in the EU as well on how do we really ensure that all these nice words are actually being turned into real action and that coherently, comprehensively, we look at the policy toolbox, the financial tools we have and ensure that they are aligned with the 2030 goals, uh, with the 2050 goals. So um, certainly a lot of work to be done in that space. Now. I would like to come back to the announcement and initiatives uh, that we saw um, at Glasgow, and these obviously were a very important part of the negotiations. So we had, for example, the Glasgow Leaders Declaration on Forest and Land Use. We had the Global, uh, Global Methane Pledge. So could you evaluate the progress on these? Are we seeing concrete efforts, plans, and what are your expectations for next steps? And what needs to happen for these to deliver results? Also, I'd be happy to come back. You mentioned uh, this country package that was agreed with South Africa, and it would be interesting to know more about this and whether this could be a blueprint for supporting also other countries in their green transitions. And then I'll finish up with a third question, and this is from Rachel Simon. So can you just go back um, and give us a bit of an explanation on on the loss and damage on first of all what were the issues uh, with loss and damage for the developed and developing countries do we need a new financing facility dedicated to loss and damage or could this be covered we are existing instruments and then specifically uh, to what rachel simon was asking is that what will the presidency be doing to move forward on the g77 and china proposal for a loss and damage finance facility and how will the presidency be working with developing and developed country parties to ensure successful dialogue that recognizes the increasing finance needs um, of frontline communities? Um, thank you. So on the first, um, yes. So we've got the, if I think about the, the sort of um, 
the the policy or the action areas that we that we took forward at Glasgow there are a number of them related to industrial action so this is the the Glasgow breakthrough agenda so that might be on decarbonizing the power sector the transport sector green hydrogen etc uh, there was action as you say on forests um, pledges to finance to on supply chains um, there was of course a number of um, pledges on on transport on moving to zero emission vehicles um, and similarly on on decarbonizing power etc what i think what i would say is some of those have uh, and our, our objective is not to set up an entire new international architecture i mean these are the objective of these was to give um what we would i suppose you call real economy action to complement the negotiations and the target setting so that you had all elements of the toolkit moving forward at the same time. So on the breakthroughs, for example, um, we have a we will come back in the in the autumn with there'll be a ministerial meeting supported by reports from the IEA um, on transport. There's the Zero Emission Transport Council on uh, on power. There's the um, Energy Transition Council, which will progress these. So there are mechanisms to progress all of these. Um, and to hold us to it. I mean, it's, you know, it's not, we don't have the mandate to sort of, uh, you know, produce a scorecard telling people what they have and haven't done. But nevertheless, we have some sort of role in encouraging people to maintain the commitments and deliver on the commitments they've made. And so the, the institutions, the organisations that either exist or we set up, we will be using for that and make and I'm, there is a you know there is a wealth of um, reporting out there whether that's the formal reporting that you see from the UN in the synthesis report or the UNEP uh, gap report and from the private um, the third sector on on how we're doing on each of those and we certainly see moving forward on those policies and actions as part of our job this year uh, whether it's through the councils we set up or, or others on loss and damage. Um, uh, so there's a number of issues. I mean, there is there is there was no consensus on a number of aspects of loss and damage at Glasgow. That is true. But there was agreement on some others. So I think one can choose either to focus on the things where there isn't an agreement or, or the ones that there is and we are focused on those where we could reach agreement so there is quite a lot of you know glasgow says i think more than any previous cop about the issue of loss and damage um about the uh the greater support that is needed to address loss and damage um uh it says something about what the santiago network needs to do and the support and funding that it will need so that it can support vulnerable countries in identifying, which I think is where we need to get to. Um, the debate about the fundamental debate, which for some countries is, you know, is the key one about issues of funds and compensation. I've no doubt that will continue. It remains quite contested. And at the moment, it's quite hard to see that there is going to be an agreement on some of on some of that. I may be wrong, but it looks to me quite quite contested. But certainly, that was the experience of at Glasgow. So, as well as having a Glasgow dialogue, which provides a format to have that, we need to make progress on the more specific issues, which is where I don't feel we've collectively yet got where we need to. Which is, what do we mean? What in particular localities are the issues? what support do countries need for identifying them and then what support do they need for addressing them and i think that's in what is a contested and controversial area that's one area where i hope we can get to uh, we can over the course of the next certainly the two years which is the the window for the uh, for the work program on loss and damage uh, make some progress um now this is, you know, first and foremost for the um, for the institutions of the UNFCCC to take forward. And but our role as presidency is to encourage that along. It's not to um, propose solutions or to tell people what the answer is, but it is as far as we can to encourage parties to engage constructively with that, to try and find the scope of a possible landing zone uh, for this year 
and then no doubt the presidency will take it on on, on next year. Um, so I think funding is going to be part clearly going to be part of that debate support for these activities. Um, and there will no doubt the, the debate about a thing, something called a fund will also uh, come up. Um, uh, we couldn't reach agreement on that in Glasgow. As I say, I think that will may, remain a very difficult issue. But if, if that's the only debate that we have, I think we'll be doing a disservice to us all. I think we also need to progress on the, on the practical action and identifying the needs and then seeing where the funding can come from. And it was encouraging that in Glasgow, a number of countries said that they were interested in providing support to the Santiago network to enable it to get stood up uh, and to provide the technical support that um, would allow us to get a bit more, a bit clearer. Uh, about what the needs are. Very good. And then uh, on the South Africa. Yes, sorry. <laughs> um, um, so I think the, th the two things to say first, this is a, I think this is a long term commitment which partners are making to each other. So the, the, the plan that the South Africans are putting forward to uh, transition their power sector uh, to increase uh, power generation from renewables and, and, and. That's a long-term project. And so our commitment to them must be long-term. So although, you know, it was, it was obviously one of the important moments in Glasgow uh, and it was, uh, it was something that leaders endorsed, I think this is a long, it's a long-term commitment we're engaged in. And it was many years in the making. So I think the first thing to say is these things are complicated. They are significant for the country concerned. They have a number of complexities and challenged as well as challenges as well as opportunities. So we all need to be in it for the long haul. Uh, we have on the on one side a number of um, donor countries and uh, institutions who want to support that. And at the moment, the UK is playing the coordinating role. On the South African side, they are have now put together a coordination mechanism, and I think are putting someone in place to be the main interlocutor uh, in that process and to set up a, some architecture so that we have a structured means of engaging with each other. Underneath that, there is going to be a huge amount of technical work about restructuring, about uh, financial vehicles, about all sorts of things that I'm afraid are a bit far beyond my level of expertise. But these are complex system-wide challenges. So when we say, so the reason that's relevant is firstly to say we have to stick with it. And the second is to say that idea should inspire us in other places, but it won't be the model in the sense that whatever we do with another country or another region, it won't be identical. Um, it will be around, ha we have a leadership because this is where it starts. You need a country which is determined to accelerate its transition and it needs support in doing that. So it needs to be led by the country concerned. So they have a plan. Uh, to decarbonize their power sector. They need support, they need assistance, and we can, we, not we, we, not the UK necessarily, but the community can bring together a package of donors, banks, development finance institutions, and in time the private sector to support them. That is, I think, a model which we are exploring with a number of other countries. And I would expect that in the course of the year, you will hear more about who those, what those, uh, what those partnerships might be. Great, thank you, Peter. Um, I recognize that we are shortly running out of time, so I'd like to finish up with two questions, um, big ones. Um, obviously, we started with recognizing the geopolitical situation and recognize that this could have shorter, longer term implications for also international collaboration. So kind of building on this, uh, obviously, you mentioned the role that EU and UK have already Plays in collaborating ahead during and I hope also uh, after the COP26. So I'm happy to hear if you have any thoughts, additional thoughts on how you think uh, we should be working together also as we head towards the COP27. But then obviously we have all these other major powers uh, that will play a key role in getting on the right track, the US, the China, obviously of Russia, um, you mentioned India, but then we also have Australia, Saudi Arabia, Brazil. So just, I know we have limited time, but just to get your feeling as to the prospects for collaboration as we head towards uh, COP27 and link to this also, what needs to happen now if we really are to ensure progress ahead 
of COP27? And what do you think are the real big next stepping stones, milestones that we should be looking at? Um, so I think people need to deliver on what they've committed to. I mean, that's the key thing. There's some pretty ambitious commitments in the Glasgow Climate Pact, and both we as presidency and those sort of externally need to be holding us all to account for delivering on those. I think that's the first thing. And that's that's true on the targets, it's true on the policies, it's also true on finance, and it's true on adaptation. So it's across the board. Uh, it's an extremely ambitious agreement, but it's not worth the paper it's written on if people don't stick with it. And there are always difficulties in every country at any moment there are always difficult debates. Um, that was true last year, it will be true this year, and it will be true next year. So we've got to engage with those and try and you know, engage with the debates, um, whether that's on the political or the economic or the technical. Um, important moments this year, I mean, the G7 and the G20 last year were important moments. I'm sure the same will be true again. Um, the UN General Assembly is always an important moment when some, you know, China has a tradition of coming forward in recent years with important commitments at the time of the General Assembly. So there will be, as, as, we've, as we try to do in 2021, is not to see the COP as a single moment, but to see it as a point in the process of, and that many events in the course of the year contribute to it. So G7, G20, I mean, one could look at the international calendar, and I'm sure you will, um, uh, and the spring meetings of the IMF and the World Bank. We, we as presidency will be, as we did last year, trying to use all of those moments to progress, uh, to progress the agenda. Uh, on, the, on the diplomacy side, uh, I mean, there's so much one could say. Look, I think our role as presidency with partners uh, is, to, uh, is to remind people what they've committed to, uh, for those who need support and assistance, whether that's financial or technical, to provide that where we can, uh, and to engage in those debates and give them arguments internally as to why they you know, need to move. And what we found last year was, provided that the arguments you're making are credible, if you create momentum, people will move. And I think the same can happen this year. The start of the year always feels a bit gloomy. It was the same in 2021. The first quarter of the year, there aren't many international meetings. People are sort of got a headache from the previous presidency. So I wouldn't draw any conclusions from the sort of atmosphere now. I think momentum will build through the year. I think the IPCC reports, the one coming out on Monday and the IPCC report in April will bring home to everybody just how serious the challenge we're facing is and they will be salutary reminders that we're not where we need to be and we need to do we need to do better as far as the uk and the eu are concerned um i think we've worked in incredibly constructively obviously we're the presidency and so we're sort of objective and neutral and, and and balanced and all the rest of it but you know we have worked constructively with um uh, the commission um european partners the european institutions um, and the European Union was a very important and constructive player at Glasgow, and I'm absolutely sure uh, that that will continue um, in, in 2022. And the EU does have some critical relationships. I mean, one could pick China as the case, the case in point, as, and in a way, you know, the most challenging, but, um, but the European Union does have some absolutely vital relationships, which can make a can have a material difference to the prospects for the year. And, you know, I've been speaking to friends and colleagues in the institutions today, and I know they, they're equally committed to, to using those relationships to try and, uh, try and make the case for uh, climate action and move the agenda forward. Great, thank you very much, Peter. It's been an absolute delight having you here today and uh, hearing your reflections and thoughts. And uh, just to say, obviously, I think the discussion has reminded us yet again, the clock is ticking, the urgency for action is there. And obviously we need to find a way how the commitments, the initiatives that were launched at the COP are actually followed up and that we really need to see how the words are now turned into action if we're to deliver on the many promises made. And I think that it's really important part of this discussion is also just understanding the multiple benefits that come from this action, the economic, the energy security, social, the climate benefits. And this can all, this should all be feeding into the narrative. And 
once we recognize the benefits of acting, maybe also accelerating action, there's ultimately nothing stopping um, countries to do more than what they have committed to. So I think that that's also very important to keep in mind. But Peter, thank you so much uh, for joining us and wishing you all the best with the work. Um, and it's certainly a lot of challenges ahead still as we head uh, to the COP27. And from the EPC perspective, we obviously continue to follow these discussions very closely and hope that there will be other possibilities for us to maybe next time also join into a physical setting and come together to continue the discussion. Thank you so much, Annika, and thank you to all those colleagues on the line um, uh, as well. Thank you. Have a good afternoon, everyone.